Right, hi everyone. Hope you're all well. Enjoying your beers. Thank you for the invitation, guys, to uh, come and talk a little bit about our story. What I'm going to do today, I've watched a couple of the other uh, cloud native media talks that I've caught up. There was a lot of chat about platforms and back end and stuff before, so I'm going to completely avoid that and talk mainly about production use cases, particularly around the sports genre where we're obviously prevalent. Um, and I'm going to try and bring to life three use cases. I need to give another time because I'm told I've only got 20 minutes, so well, it's 25 past. <laughs> um, I'll try and keep it in the 20 minute window. Um, my assistant is here with me, Pete, uh, who has helped to work on a lot of the cloud projects, so he's around later as well. If you want to dig into some of our details, also here to bail me out if this goes wrong, because we're trying to do something a little bit different with the demo. So if it does go wrong, I apologise, and we'll just try and fix it as we go. Anyway, so where are we at with our cloud journey? So um, BT Sport have been doing cloud for about 18 months now, um, and uh, the, uh, we started really our investigation working on a collaborative project with IBC, one of the IBC accelerators, I'm sure. Uh, you folks will know those, and um, we worked collaboration with Sky and with BBC and the Premier League, and we looked at the real premise of that accelerator was as well as exploring the art of the possible with cloud production tools, you know, how fit for purpose were they really for a tier one type <coughs> big end sporting event like the Premier League, but also there were lots and lots of claims in lots and lots of events, probably some looking a little bit like this, with a similar name, but also IBCs and NABs from lots of the cloud vendors, not looking at anyone, but claiming great sustainability benefits of cloud production, right? So claiming that there's huge carbon gains to be made and efficiencies um, for, our, um, for our productions. And of course, being a sustainable broadcaster, part of the Albert Certified uh, Consortium, that's really important to us. Our staff and our customers really care that we care about the, the environment, so that's a really important thing. So we came together and we started working together to see whether we could make a sizable dent, or any dent at all, in fact, on the um, on the carpet print of a Premier League OB. That's where we started about a year. And then we started to get quite excited and started to do all sorts of other things. So we then took the technology a bit further and did um, a, uh, an event in Scotland with the Scottish uh, national team where we uh, did a skills council thing in half term. All the Scottish team, half through the Six Nations, unfortunately, they were two games down at that point, so they weren't very helpful or very happy. But we did a, an interactive schools thing. And then we took it on a step further. I'm going to start to share a couple of those, those use cases with us. But before I do, I'm just quickly pick up on the debate that you highlighted earlier, Paul, about what is cloud native, what does it mean for us all? And I've got your statement here that I saw off the, the first show. For us, it means a couple of extra things, actually, in BT Sport. It means the opportunity to be, as I said before, more sustainable. These claims are out there all the time. So hopefully for us, it means we can really make an impact on our environment. But also, and I think this is really, really exciting, cloud native productions should allow us to be much more accessible. Traditionally, broadcast infrastructure, particularly outside broadcast trucks, are really inhospitable if you've got any kind of accessibility problems. Physical, sight, hearing, etc. And the ability to work in a diverse environment, work from home, work wherever suits you and your environment, cloud should enable us to unlock that and make us as an industry much more accessible um, to potential new um, people to come work in our industry, uh, which we need desperately at the minute, you probably know, with my rise hat on. Um, and the other thing I want to say is that I don't really like talking about cloud production or to cloud native particularly, if I can help it, because it is such a generic term and it's been around, floating around now for so long and it means such a really vast array of different things to different people. And some people now use cloud to mean on-prem as much as they do off-prem, which makes it really confusing. Um, and that isn't really the objective. We don't really care about that, do we? What we care about is, or I, what I care about, is how do we move our technology stack forward from old-fashioned hardware and there was a slide in the first week you know, looking at SDI moving into IP, moving into cloud. It's actually about software-defined production. And I think that's a much more useful term. What we're trying to do is get away from the legacy, which we wanted to do, and we talked about it for a long time, but now we have, haven't got much choice, because you can't buy the bloody stuff anymore, because it isn't available. And if you want to buy IP infrastructure, it's even worse. Um, so you might as well not even bother trying to buy a binary to switch at the minute or any of the, um, any of the encapsulation devices we need. So that's a waste of time. So actually, software-defined production using uh, really much more commonly available and particularly in public cloud tool sets is much more exciting. And that's the journey we're on. It's taking our production technology from being a hardware environment to a software-defined uh, production stack. So I'll um, dig into uh, a couple of these examples. The first example I'm going to have to share with you is around uh, a youth league game we did for UEFA. This was really exciting because this was the first time that UEFA had allowed us to uh, do cloud production on their events. UEFA are a particularly um, uh, diligent rights holder, shall we say, well, wait, it's being recorded, um, <laughs> really, um, and, and rightly so, really high standards, and they're very, very uh, strict and demanding about what you can and can't do and the technology you have to bring to cover a game. And they approached us and saw what we were doing and said, we'd love to work with you. We'd love to try and do something uh, around uh, cloud production. 
Uh, I'll talk about the drawing in a minute. Before I do, I'm going to roll the Now, I want to explain something about what's happening here. What we thought we'd do, rather than just come with PowerPoint and talk to you, we thought we'd try and actually put our money where our mouth is. So what we've got going on here is something a bit different, and I hope it's interesting. So my laptop, which is connected to the screen, is actually not running PowerPoint at all. It's running um, an NDI Studio Monitor, which is a product from uh, New Tech, free software, part of the NDI tool set. And also on my laptop, I'm running NDI Bridge. And that is connected to our Warner Brothers Discovery uh, public VPC, which is running up in AWS in Ireland. And in that environment, we're running uh, two live production environments right now. We're running two different systems in parallel. Pete's laptop behind me is running PowerPoint, but it's also running one of the other NDI tool sets, which is called Scan Converter, which is scanning the PowerPoint on his full screen monitor, sending it as an NDI stream to Bridge and being syndicated into our production environment. And I'm now subscribing to that stream via our vision mixing software. So if I cut around here, you can see this. This is another source in my live switcher in the cloud. This is actually coming out of AWS right now. Um, and um, just to prove it, you've got the thing there, Pete. This is my little proof demo. So this is another device. I'll borrow it for you. <laughs> so this, this is, my, this is my, my 4G connected camera, no Wi-Fi here. This is connected to the 4G public network using an app from LiveView straight into our back-end LiveView VPC. And so you're all going in, and it's all about a one second delay. But that's a live demo from here straight into our VPC, back into our production tool set, which I'll talk about in a minute, and then down to my monitor on the edge and displayed um, on the, the TV here. Right, so, well, I was really worried because the Wi-Fi was shit when we turned up. <laughs> but we've now, we've now got there. So, uh, so other things here, I can bring a bit of music. I've got some bubble running in the background on our, on our, um, on our uh, cloud instance. So we've got all the, this is you know, a proper production art running in the background. Um, but I'm going to show you a video about our um, UA for Luke. This will save me some time if I show you the video because it's only three minutes and it will hopefully elaborate much quicker than in me waffling on and we can talk about some more interesting stuff perhaps. So if I, oh no, wrong one. <laughs> so traditional coverage of a UEFA Youth League game would involve us sending lots of infrastructure to the ground where the match is being played. So for example, we send um, a match scanner or an outside broadcast truck. We send uh, an articulated uh, tender vehicle with all the cameras and cables and tripods and microphones, a very large heavy generator and a satellite linked vehicle. And there we would produce a, a six camera world feed that we then send by satellite around the world to UEFA world feed partners, but also to ourselves in Stratford where we would normally then add graphics and commentary for our own channel. In this new model, we are doing away with nearly all that infrastructure and just retaining the cameras and microphones, but now taking the output of those into cloud encoders. This is using 5G or 4G or fixed line internet to connect into the public cloud where we're running a completely virtualized production center. So in that production center, we are visual mixing, we are sound mixing, we're adding graphics, we're adding replays, and we're adding commentary. And only at the very end do we bring those signals back out of the cloud for distribution, either the world feed to UEFA's world feed partners or to our playout center to broadcast onto our channel. We've done previous trials, such as the IBC uh, Cloud Accelerator, where we saw that uh, this sort of cloud production technique can reduce the carbon footprint of a, of a traditional gallery by up to 70%. But this model takes it a lot further because that was just a gallery. This time we're doing away with all that on-prem infrastructure, all those big heavy trucks, all those people traveling to site. So we expect the reductions to be much, much greater. BT Sports Live, Premier League, Champions League and Premiership Rugby broadcasts already BAFTA album certified productions, so they meet some of the higher sustainability standards globally. We're aiming for all BT Sport produced live, football, rugby, boxing, documentaries, to meet the same standards over 2022 and beyond. And really key to these trials is to reflect on the trials uh, and, and understand what we can learn uh, before making any decisions. All of that said, the potential benefits are clear. It allows us to focus freed up resource on content, enhances our sustainability footprint, and supports our people in terms of work-life balance and diversity, which obviously is better for our people and really importantly for our audiences who are engaging with this content. I should talk more about um, UEFA and our relationship with UEFA. Um, I'm so proud of the relationship we've built and I know it's mutual. Um, since 2015, we have been pioneering new ways of engaging and taking people to the heart of sport. And moving to the cloud is another really big opportunity. You can't do this without the support of your partners. So uh, as always with our relationship with UEFA, I'm extremely grateful and really proud that for the first time, we at BT Sport will be doing a cloud production around a live UEFA game 
um, in conjunction with them and with their support. So it's fantastic for all of us. So I don't know if you could hear that. <clears throat> I'll very quickly run over it again so you've got more clarity and I'll explain the difference between what we started with and what we ended up with and why it's really important. So in the traditional production model for the, the UEFA Youth League, uh, it's a relatively small competition. So the camera specifications are only uh, six cameras, um, a basic array of pitch microphones around the edge of the pitch, and the welfare distribution has no commentary. It just has uh, the pitches and the match effects. And regional broadcasters and affiliates can take those feeds and personalise them as appropriate. So when we're host broadcaster, we uh, mount an AB at the truck. In the case that we were at, we were in, um, uh, where were we? Man City. And um, we put our truck out. There's a lot of people on site. So you have to have a director and a producer, and you have to have replay operators, and you have to have um, <coughs> you know, all, the, all the AB crew. So traditionally, it's 24 odd people there. You've got a 37 and a half ton articulated uh, AB truck. You've got a, a supporting vehicle, like a, scan, um, a tender. Got a twin set generator, and you've got the satellite truck you can see in those uh, videos. So lots and lots of heavy infrastructure <coughs> has to land on the ground at the event. Then we back call over satellite because it's uh, normally a remote venue, not a, a, a key Premier League ground. They often play these games at sister sites, uh, training grounds. And that would go up onto the bird, and both wealthy takers, uh, EVU in the case of UEFA, would take it and distribute it worldwide. We bring it down, and in our studios in Stratford, we would then add have another little production team who would add our own titles, commentary, graphics, replays, etc. So there's another five people and a load more kit had to run here in Stratford, and then we then send it off for play out for our friends at Red B. So this is the interesting bit. When we did the migration before with I IBC, we only really made an improvement in carbon in the gallery piece of the workflow. You still had this heavy lifting here. And so we'd, we'd taken some of the traditional broadcast infrastructure in our galleries down, vision mixers and things, and moved it into the cloud. But that was really, although it was showed a big saving in the gallery, it was 70% of the gallery, not 70% of the whole production. So although it's exciting, it wasn't really moving the needle particularly. And then what's really interesting here is how far we then move in one step. So there's no more vehicles apart from the transit van, which turned up with the uh, live view backpacks and the cameras and the microphones. Uh, and that was all that was there. The, uh, we put the six uh, cameras out and now they're plugged into live view backpacks rather than long heavy runs back to the OB truck. The microphones around the pitch connected into a little mixer, which is battery powered, um, which feeds into a couple of the backpacks for resilience. We also had a pair of spare mics on the gantry as is standard practice in football. So camera one audio backups. And they are just connected both by the 5G, which actually was available at Man City, um, sorry, the broadband, but also over the public um, cell networks as well. And that was it. So you can see how much carbon we've taken out of this production because there's so few people coming to that event than were before. Um, those feeds go up into our VPC, which is running in Ireland, and all of our production tool set is then, is then living in here. So uh, we decode the incoming feeds, we're running our vision mixers and our replay and our car run. In this case, we're using Viz Vector, if you're interested. Um, and Viz 3 play, Chiron Prime was running in, a, in an instance, we are doing the audio mixer, we ran some uh, multi-viewing uh, multi applications, and then we were sending WebRT stream streams back out to people who wanted to see on the ground the return uh, for confidence. Um, and then we were running a commentary IO um, from the, that as well into our studio, which I'll talk about in a second. And then bringing those feeds, both of them down to, um, down to uh, the ground on two diverse paths, one through a, uh, one fibre provider, which is named on the slide, because I used to work for them, and the other through a third party network provider to give us some resilience. And all the control is happening in here, but we're just bringing down um, a world feed and a finished BT Sport programme feed that we can then distribute to the world. The rest of it is a few proxies through NDI Bridge and all of the control layer to make the switching and the replays um, and the audio faders happen. And that's it. So we're down from having uh, loads of feeds having to come through to a, a smaller quantity. Um, for that piece of region. So you can see that was massively impactful. So the carbon footprint on site now has gone probably down to 30% of its original um, proposition. And no one can tell the difference at home, right? We still made our world feed, we fully fulfilled our obligations for UEFA, we still made our BT Sport program feed, and no one knew uh, any difference at all. Um, to do this, we built a, um, a cloud gallery because operational interfaces, UI is still really important, right? You still have to have the right tools. You know, producers and directors still want to be able to connect. Touch screens are still not that popular with our, with our um, production teams, mouse and things. They want typical tactile interfaces and they want decent quality monitoring. So we built them a, a dedicated, I don't know if it's in here actually, gallery. Um, I've got a photo of it, no, maybe I haven't. Um, but 
you might have seen it in the gallery. But what we have got as a bit of fun is this morning, just for a laugh, we put a, a, a PTZ camera in the gallery, uh, which we thought we'd show you. So this is a live feed to our um, to our uh, cloud gallery in Stratford. Uh, so this is this is the whole of that gallery I described. So these are all everything you see here is just monitors connected to PCs. Uh, it's all in this room basically. Um, the room's got dual redundant power cores, so we don't want it to fall over. Backed by UPS. Um, but fundamentally, all these control services you can see are all um, connecting into our cloud instance, same as I am here through the Stream Deck. And these monitoring can all be changed. Um, they're all, they're all um, NDI Studio monitors looking at uh, NDI streams coming down out of the cloud. Just to prove that's real, if I do something, I don't know if this is going to work, Pete. How's it going to work? I need to change it on here, don't I? Uh, do no, I need to, no, no, I need to, that's oh, through the beam no, 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 no. Wait, I need to do this. So if I do this, let's see if this works. Now, here we go. <coughs> this is how the lot <coughs> There we go. So now the quality is crap. I apologise for the quality, but um, we don't have time to work out why the quality was crap. But fundamentally, you can see the point. This is I've got a special shortcut, haven't I? So um, we could we can. Um, this is live in our cloud control room. The clock is running. I don't know how far it is. Um, but this is a live demo out of Stratford, back into our cloud environment. We're switching that through the switch production switcher to you here right now. So. Um, so the point being that when, when production teams walk in, I know it's, uh, you know, this looks, hopefully, it looks like as good as any other production gallery, right? It's, in a, it's now in our Stratford studio, it's not in an OB truck, so it's got accessible access. The disabled toilet is about five metres away from this room, so it means we can open this up to people who might not have been able to go, or wouldn't, certainly wouldn't be able to go to, to the Etihad and work in the, that truck. They can now come and be part um, of this production environment. Um, and it was really important that to the team, when they walk in, it looks and feels reliable, robust, like broadcast technology. None of it is, but it needed to look comfortable and people feel comfortable at home making TV. And the UEFA, when they walk in, believe we're going to make credible TV that's safe and we're going to look after their product for them. So that's why it was really important to us to make a, a good environment that's, um, that's decent. Uh, how am I doing for time? <laughs> so, uh, oh, cheapers, five minutes. So, um, oh, I broke it now, I think. That doesn't work. <coughs> so, oh no. Ask why, I was on the same source. <laughs> Too many vision mixers in the loop. So <coughs> in summary, what do we have? Well, we were at Premier League ground, but it was actually their sister stadium in, in, uh, in uh, Manchester. Our cloud gallery was in uh, Stratford, you've seen it. But interestingly, we worked with an operational production partner called uh, Limitless. Now, Limitless are an interesting little startup. They're really into cloud production techniques. They're a bit more uh, forward thinking, perhaps, than some traditional outside broadcast providers. And they've been working with us to provide the facilities on the ground for us. Now, what's interesting is they've got their own little setup in Woking, some of their own MCR facilities. So rather than bring their guys into Stratford unnecessarily to rack the cameras and trade the cameras and other things, we just gave them a uh, NDI bridge login in Woking and the vision engineer who was shading those cameras live, it was a you know, normal day, sun going in and out, so the cameras need to be sh shaded actively the whole time, was sat in Woking, taking another split of the multi-view, I could give you an example, here's the multi-view, um, <coughs> that gonna work, and, and could shade away to his heart skin, and we built touchdowns. So when they touched down on their OCP panel, they were live switching the source into the studio monitor against the program out. So they were doing real-time switching, just like you'd expect in a vision gallery, but completely remotely from Woking, um, in, 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 a, in an appropriate way. So, that was Youth League. Uh, I've talked about it before. Tool sets really interesting. So people have got different views on tool sets and you can probably find someone in this room who will argue really strongly in favour of one particular product, others another type of product, different ways of building the infrastructure. What we found is that actually the tool set required depends really, really on the production requirements. And actually there's no such thing as one production requirement for every use case. Um, the, oh, I've copied and pasted the wrong slide. Uh, the, um, I'll come off that and then kick off. Anyway, we'll come back to that thought. Um, yeah, I hope that's interesting. So then we moved it on a step. That was the footballer camera plan. We're running out of time, so I'll be quick. We then moved it on. So we did two or three of these for UEFA, and that's our standard model. We'll always do that model for the youth league. That is our standard way of working. We won't change it. Then we came to another event, which is not a standard event in our calendar. It's something that uh, is actually a marketing am campaign for our friends in EE. They run something called the Pub Cup. And as part of our um, Comprem uh, licensing deals with pubs and clubs, we try to give something back and we let them run a competition where they can end up basically competing in their five side teams, or they're actually not their, their full teams. They can compete in competition, and if they win, the pub team can come and play at Wembley, which is a great opportunity for them. So they approached us and said, look, we want to cover this live, we want to put it on YouTube, it's really cool, how can we make it cool? But by the way, we're marketing folk, we've got no money. 
So, uh, so we said, well, we've, interesting, we've got this workflow we've developed for the Youth League, and we think it's really useful. There's one problem, they now want InVision presentation. Now, the uh, Youth League, the commentator was off tube. So the commentator was on the same timing plane in the gallery as we were, and it doesn't matter whether you've got one second of latency from the camera to the gallery or 20 seconds, it actually doesn't matter at all, particularly, because you're, as a match producer, you're just cutting cameras as they're arriving at you, and it doesn't make a huge amount of difference. Obviously, you can't be dramatic, but you get the point. Whereas when you're talking about InVision presenters, you need to throw to those presenters and get them to do pickups and all that stuff and running graphics, the latency becomes much more of a problem. Um, but we rose to the challenge and we adapted the model we already had um, and uh, added two more camera packs uh, on site so we could do presentation. The great thing about the, certainly the bonded backpack solution is that the cameras immediately become, can become fixed pitch side cameras on legs, but they can be picked up and immediately become presentation cameras. So suddenly to a director, although we only had eight cameras, it feels like he's got 12, 13 cameras in, and he could ask the cameras to wander off where they wanted. So we could do a one plus two shot by the pitch with Robbie Savage or whoever the it was oh, his own hard groups. Um, and you can go and do all sorts of things, colour in the tunnel, you can go and get dressing room shots, teams arriving, you can go in the middle of the pitch at half time and circle around the players as they walk off, but they still get your full um, six, seven camera match coverage at the same time with no extra cost and no extra resource. So the ability to be really flexible because of that solar bonded approach combined with the cloud production tool was really, really powerful. And we were on air, <laughs> I couldn't believe it. This went on all day. Uh, <laughs> it went on for about six hours. The team were on air from, because we had two games back to back, one men's and then one's women, with a huge break in the middle. So the poor team were working. So we're now pretty confident it's relatively robust because it stayed on air <laughs> for hours and hours um, without any problem. And that was using pretty much the same infrastructure as the, as the other one. We were still using VizVector. We were still using uh, 3Play. Graphics again from Prime. My last use case, because I'm going to run out of time and I'm going to get boot, booted off. Um, that's, the, that's the camera flam, which I'll talk about quickly, it was, a, it was a new show that launched in autumn last year uh, called Early Kickoff. And the brief from production for us was, brand new show, we want to tease the Premier League on a Saturday morning at about 10 o'clock, 10.30. We want to warm, warm fans up to something in the morning, get them in the mood, get a sense of the chat, what's happening in the world, what sports stories are broken, you know, have players woken up not been selected for the squad, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and they wanted it to be look really different. They wanted it to be really earthy in the compound. We went after Chris was inside a truck because it was so wet outside. But you know they, they wanted it to be in the out really down and dirty in amongst it, not pretty pitch side or in a studio. Just really seeing what's going on, grabbing pundits as they walk past, bringing them into the conversation, um, and all that kind of stuff. And so we, this was the first show we developed, which was genuinely cloud first. We'd never done this show in linear. We'd never done it in in hardware or in traditional um, infrastructure. And so we thought we'd build this from the ground up and only do this show. This show has never been made in a normal gallery. It's only ever been made in the, the cloud production tool set. Um, and it's very similar back end. We're still using Live View for the agility. Uh, we're using vMix in the cloud rather than Viz. And there's some reasons for that, which I'll come on to in just a second. Um, but fundamentally, it's the same kind of model uh, and the same kind of agility that is afforded to us. Now, why do we choose vMix for this show rather than the Viz Vector? A, a number of reasons. The digital team who are producing the show, which is not our normal football production team, use vMix all the time. They use it on laptops in the field, they use it uh, uh, for other applications, so they're really, really familiar with the operating interface and they know how to configure it and operate it. So it was a really easy onboarding ramp from an operational perspective. But actually there were a couple of other really important requirements that they had, which we couldn't do in any other tool set at the minute. One was they wanted to bring in um, callers remotely, so why you've got our, our host Rob and Rio and Fletch in Newcastle, they wanted the ability to bring in other talent, commentators, particularly if a story was breaking about a manager sacking or something, they wanted to be able to bring them in. So vMix has a lovely native feature in it called vMix Call, where you can bring in callers over WebRTC link, reload latency, really fast, and vMix sorts out the IFB for you so you get a clean feed. So it's brilliant. Um, so that was one feature. And the other feature was they really wanted a big use of social graphics. And they wanted an HTML5 tool called Display, which used to be called NeverNo. Some of you may have come across it. And there's only a couple of ways you can integrate that, either through well, OBS, really, or, um, or vMix. Um, so if you can use a different tool set, you still have to have a tool to bring the HTML5 into your production and convert it to NDI. So we just did it all natively in, inside. I've got a live demo of, the vMix of that for you, hopefully. Where's that demo thing? Uh, no, have I? Display. Oh, it's, on the, um, it's on that one, isn't it? There you go. So this is the live uh, display wall. So this is coming from a second production instance. This is actually running in the early kickoff instance itself. You've got your strap on there as well. Oh yeah, I can't turn it off. It's keyed on the other one, isn't it? 
Um, so this is an example, this is what they cut to. So this is um, a, live, a live social feed. They have tools on iPads so they can, they can change this dynamically from the Winnebago and the instance last weekend. You can pull up a tweet, make it go full frame, make it a part of the conversation. So integration of these sorts of tools was really important to that particular production team, which is why we chose that source. This is actually the, the Champions League background they put on for me because I asked them at five o'clock to turn it on. <laughs> so um, but hopefully it gives you an idea of some of the constraints we want to integrate. As Pete's pointed out, there's a graphic there, but if I actually go back to our where are we going? If I go back to here, I can key the graphic on through, it's real. There you go, there's a live graphic going in. So that's going on our live, our live um, production system. Uh, so that's early kickoff. Um, uh, and again, I've talked already about the distributed working. I'll put this slide in, I should have showed it earlier. But on this early kickoff, so the first early kickoff show, which I showed you the photo, you know, our talent were on the ground in Manchester at uh, the Etihad uh, in the car park. Um, the Guys were in our cloud gallery in Stratford, and the and the shading was being all done from Luminous HQ and Woking. No need to go anywhere else. All just works. That wide area um, collaboration is really possible and enabled by these software defined tools. So that's it. I was supposed to leave some time for questions, but I might have overrun for. I don't know. It's um, oh no, I've got five minutes. <laughs> so that's what I wanted to share. <coughs> really good, amazing stuff. Andy, um, and, and did we have a time for a couple of questions, I think. Has anybody got a, a question? We can always chat in the pub Let, afterwards as well. Let's, yeah, I mean, yeah. Thank you. Um, first of all, the, the, the untethered camera thing was great with the, the cell pack. That's, that's brilliant. The, the question I had was, going through this process, you've talked about all various aspects, but what was the, did you see any shortcomings of, uh, as you went through building the, this out, what shortcomings did you did you come across? Good question. Um, tell you what shortcomings did we come across? It didn't seem that many. You no. Know, some of the tools are quite young. Yeah, yeah. Some of the I mean, when we started a year ago, a half ago, the NDI five had just turned up, which was a really key enabler, and NDI five version one was quite flaky. Um, in fact, it still occasionally has a wall. Um, and other other tools that are in this space, even back to now, you know. Vmix is mature for on-prem tin, but we're still bedding it in here. But some of the other tools, like you say, things like Vector really have got big gaps. I don't, I'm sure what I'm saying this because everyone's got big gaps. Really basic audio functionality, for example, that we take for granted in a really quite inexpensive <laughs> mixer that you might spend, you know, four figures on, has got better audio processing than a lot of the cloud production tools at the minute. And so you have to be careful not to, um, not to mismatch. We spent a bit of time with, with some fun with instance sizes. So one of the problems we had initially was the classic cloud problems that have been talked about, you know, one day we turned up and wanted a particular instance that wasn't available, which was fun. Um, we also found something really curious, and uh, we discovered there was a weird, uh, well we, what we consider to be a weird missizing of the instances. So we, very conservatively, when you wait for standing next to me, watching over my shoulder, we booted everything up in the biggest instance we could find, <laughs> to be really <laughs> sure. And then for the second week, we thought, oh, that was ridiculous, what were we doing? We were getting like 5% GP <laughs> and CPU usage. We'll scale it back down. But what we hadn't spotted was, the one we had chosen by accident had an inordinate amount of GPU, and the next one down had one. <laughs> so, so, we were, so not even realising it, we dropped one instance back thinking that would probably be fine. Hadn't spotted the GPU association by accident. And so it gave us some problems. So, we had to, so you've got to be really careful making sure you match the right GPU. It's obvious, I'm sure, but you've got to match the right GPU with the CPU. Um, and it's just a learning curve, right? So it's about bringing people on the journey. So we've had to bridge cape, now put a lot of our guys through AUS training, starting to familiarise themselves. We're abstracting or trying to abstract a lot of the tools. We didn't have time to talk about it, but we've been building um, API and web-based GUIs to turn and orchestrate the turning on and off of the back end um, to make it simpler for folks. They haven't got to but you still need someone available, right, who, if it goes wrong, knows what's going on and can get stuck into it. I don't have the mic, but I was going to follow up with, like, um, compromise, follow on from that. Did you make compromises? And you, you sort of answered that a little bit there as well. In terms of, like you were saying, like, the audio quality and from a mixing point of view. Yeah, I mean, we, we were worried. We, we, it wasn't a problem. We well, worked out how it needed to do it. And the way that the software developers had implemented it wasn't the same way that a traditional sound company may have done. And this is one of the interesting things, because different vendors now are playing in the space they didn't before. So traditional people who have made replay products or vision products are now having to build, because they believe they have to have a one-stop shop, tools which aren't really their forte, and they miss some obvious things. So being really thorough about checking things like you know, getting clean feeds, enough clean feeds out of a desk, for, even for four presenters, sounds obvious, right? And on an audio sound desk, it just does it. But actually, they haven't built that necessarily, in the, or, the, or they could have done it, but they hadn't put the controls in for it. <laughs> so there's enough power, but they, so little things. So you've got to be really, really thorough in your, in your testing. 
Those use cases were fine, all fitted. It's definitely not ready to do a big, you know, multi-camera Premier League game yet. Um, with, you know, with 20 odd cameras and that sort of stuff, we would just we would run out. I think the vision would be fine. We'd run out of audio capability quite rapidly. Um, but the replay is getting better and better. Replay was a really weak area, and um, but the new tools are starting to look more, more, more exciting and more robust. Um, was a question there. Yeah. Hi, Hi Tony. Andy, thank you for <coughs> the presentation, absolutely outstanding. Um, I have about 50 questions, but I'll try and limit it to two. Um, I'm particularly interested in latency, um, on operational latency. So um, the, the people working in Woking, Woking uh, had to um, open and close the iris, which is a physical change in the camera, which is obviously going to be some latency, and there's going to be like the human effect of that. Yep. Um, and how does, how, how, how does that happen? You know, if you open the iris, I'm, I, I've worked in trucks, and you open the iris, it happens almost instantly. I, sus I suspect with this kind of um, system, it's going to take, there's going to be some lag there. Uh, and how yeah. do they cope with that? Yeah, latency is the biggest, question, is the biggest yeah. headache. Ground to cloud is still the number one biggest challenge, I think, that we, apart from all the development of all the production yeah. tools. And the, and the second question is, ba uh, also moving on from there, is um, you know, in the old-fashioned uh, days of SDI, when you hot switched a camera on a, um, on a, a vision mixer, um, it happened almost instantly. But I'm assuming that again there's going to be latency. So how do the people operate well, look, the kit? Well, this is a live this is a live system. So I'm going to cut around now. I'm cutting between sources. So I'm actually if I go um, that, that's the social feed loop. The social feed loop. So it's about probably about 18 seconds between me pressing the button and it catching up. That's the vision mixer latency. It's really actually quite fast and not a problem. A lot of our people now have got used to cutting remote production anyway. So we've been doing remote production on, even on the really big stuff. Um, on the Premier League and Champions League and everything um, over more traditional broadcast hardware now for three years. And so that little tiny latency has become quite familiar to them when you... Um, so they, they sort of adapt it? I think so, yeah, yeah but you're right. The, interesting, the really interesting problem is ground to cloud. And the problem is we need to always deploy these things in the short term now in venues where there's not enough connectivity or connectivity limited. So you then have to make compromises about error correction and extra bandwidth to compensate for the for the risk of that connectivity piece and suddenly you've got a longer latency and the whole thing becomes harder. So it's really interesting, paradoxically, we're choosing the, the ones that are easy to experiment because they're low value are the harder venues to play with. And that's the focus of a, that's one of the reasons I talk about stopping the fine production at the start. One of the things we're going to try and look at if we're successful with our application to the RBC this year, we want to do a, an accelerator where we look at dividing the software stack into on-prem and off-prem, where you've got a very limited middle bit of connectivity, but you've got enough probably to bring back a program feed and some monitoring feeds, but you abstract some software controlled stuff in the truck, but not hardware. We don't vision mixers old school. And all direct, we want a software truck stack in here, which is not cloud by definition, yeah. and some of it in the cloud. Maybe graphics goes on in the cloud, and you, it's a hybrid environment to try and overcome that exact problem. So our snappily titled title for it is called Software Defined Production in a Bandwidth Constrained Location, which I know sounds really un, <laughs> really unsexy, but the point is, the point is, it's a really, it's a real tangible problem. This, this, you know, we do National League every week, eight cameras over satellite at the minute. Same problem, how do you do that and try and, in a, in a post-hardware world, that's what I'm talking about, how do you do that? And that's what we're trying to understand and experiment with. Excellent, thank you. <coughs> I think there was one more question somewhere around here. Yeah, very, very last one and then we need to move on. Thank you, thank you Andy for uh, good demos especially. Um, I, I was wondering, uh, could you give some indicative uh, latencies and bit rates in two points? The first point when you're sending actually the contribution feed to satellite, because I would assume there is encoding going on in the <coughs> And the second point, I saw the encoder in the cloud as well. I would assume that would be AWS elemental kind of cloud-based solution. What would be the, their latencies and uh, bit rates you're using for so distribution? So if I wind back, to the original, I think to answer your question. So this original model, this is the old fashioned model, gone too far, is fairly traditional, you know, nine megs of space, H.264, I'm not sure what bandwidth they use, that's, I'm sorry, I'm sure there's lots of people in the room who can tell me what we use. The contribution engine is, what would we use, I don't know, 40, 80 megs something, I don't know. But this is fairly traditional ABC intro, ABC encoding with traditional satellite hop delays, right? This is nothing particularly exciting. This is bog standard, done you know, hundreds of times a day all over the world by hundreds of people. The latency in this piece, which is I think the pertinent question, is we were running these encoders at about one second, yeah? Which is what the, we've got the camera set to here on the phone. So if I go back to the phone shot. Oh, uh, you turned it off, okay. <laughs> the um, same latency. So a second basically from <coughs> encoder here to being in here. And then we're talking about, you know, 40 milliseconds, maybe slightly more between 
the, the, the VPC and the monitoring in the, in the gallery. Does that answer the question or not? Here, yeah. so this is this is the SRT encode. So this was <coughs> so for cloud to ground. This was a, uh, this was SRT running HEVC. Actually, I think I come a bit right. Forgive me, but we weren't too worried about latency there because that's the transmission path. So the gallery crew in the production gallery, they're looking at all the low latency NDI streams, HX streams coming through the bridge. They don't ever see this. This just goes to TX. What they do need to do though is line up, them, line up with play out. So there is a process before we go to air to look at the offset between the, the, this feed leaving us and our monitoring so they can do the correct offset on the count. So when the play out director says, you know, coming out of the break, they need to know what the offset between the two is. So it doesn't matter what it is, it doesn't actually matter whether it's four seconds or longer, because we want a bit of more you know, quality assurance in here. So we had a bit of error correction and everything else to make sure it's a really good, um, beautiful signal. Doesn't get, doesn't get contended or affected by the internet blips or outages. Um, but it's just understanding that offset so, the, so that the PA in the gallery can do the right counts for the production team to hit it. The important bit is the relay latency for the monitoring in the gallery that you, uh, you saw earlier here. That's the bit that matters for a production point of view. But you do have to know the offset so you can line up and go to air with an accurate count to the channel, to the network. <laughs> yeah? Fantastic. And, and just another big hand for... for <coughs> please, please. <coughs> I mean... I mean we talk about cloud native media i mean that's it really isn't it that that is absolutely it so the question is that follows on from that is how do we do all of this without burning lots and lots of energy and, and consuming lots of water and have lots of waste and andrew from aws is here to answer that question 